Hi friends, welcome again to another episode of Beyond the Clouds, Edge to Edge Transformation. And speaking about transformation, I've known Vic Kulkarni from the days that he used to transform the way power was utilized in chips and computer systems, to now he is transforming the whole industry as a part of the Semiconductor Industry Association. Vic, tell us about your journey. Tell us more about what you've been up to lately. Uh, thank you, Shankar, for the opportunity to share my thoughts with you and your audience. So this is a great opportunity to, to reflect back on my journey and also share some key takeaways uh, with you. Uh, I did my Bachelor's of Technology BTEC at IIT Bombay, and my passion for transistors and microelectronics really dates back to my childhood when I started tinkering around with building transistor radios, burglar alarms, rain alarms, and so on, uh, using homemade photovoltaic devices, and then started to read up everything on electronics. So my, my guru, uh, if you will, was Anil Bolkar, who had recently won the Young Scientist of India Award, uh, who became my partner and, and mentor. So over many weekends, I would get involved in a complex project with him for science fair and so on. And I think I was 11, 12 years old at that time uh, and was fascinated by the magic of electronic circuits and what was possible. So that was my starting point. So after graduating from IIT Bombay in EE and specialization in solid state, I continued my passion in this field during the graduate studies at University of Cincinnati, where my research project was funded by NASA. And that was for advanced devices called double injection devices for specific NASA project. We fabricated those devices in the solid state lab. So there is a personal experience in the lab itself, which was pretty exhilarating. And then started my PhD program. Uh, but however, within first quarter, National Semiconductor came on campus and lured me for my first job to the beautiful Bay Area. So this passion for semiconductor and EDA has continued during my entire career in Silicon Valley. And then over the years, I, was, uh, I got after my job in National Semi, uh, was also a team member in the cutting edge R&D labs at Fairchild, a VLSI technology then, uh, focused on innovative CMOS, gate arrays and standard cell architectures. And frankly, thanks to uh, many technology leaders and game changers like Larry Ross, Doug Fairburn, uh, Andrew Yang and Tushar Giwala for tests, on-chip tests, and Haley brothers, uh, Sean and, and, uh, and his brother, uh, Haley. And then uh, who are the inventors of Spice, Edge Spice, and Norman Chang, who was my most current and recent guru at ANSYS. Uh, he taught me all about AI and machine learning for uh, advanced uh, workloads, as well as how to create uh, go-to-market strategies from technical point of view as well as from innovation point of view, especially for Air Force. And then, of course, Wally Ryans uh, and many other EDA leaders who shaped my career. One of the exhilarating experience was the IPO process of Meta Software. I learned about product positioning, product marketing, uh, how to connect the dots in the growing market, defining the market space, and really taking the technology and convert that into a a high value a product line for customers. And there was a 160 million valuation back in 1995. And so that was a very fulfilling experience and gave me a head start uh, to really co-found the company sequence design for uh, innovative EDA solutions and tests, and also for energy efficient IP and SOC designs. And the Power Artist family, which we created there continues to be a, a winning product. Uh, after our acquisition by Apache and then ANSYS. So many years I continued there and, and expanded the business with other colleagues. And most recently, I was chief strategy officer at SI2. It's an industry joint venture, essentially focused on EDA software interoperability. So how do you look at all these workloads in various verticals? To that end, what I did was to study the uh, our members and their feedback. We had about 75 members, including all semiconductor companies, system companies, cloud companies, and amazing leadership. It kind of inspired me to launch a, a brand new initiative 
called Titan, T-I-T-A-N, for technology interoperability. And that was a, a good game changer. I managed to kind of attract about 45 to 50 uh, key technologists and created three different initiatives within Titan umbrella so that we can help the members and, and uh, end products and the uh, end success. So secure process data API, but I dubbed it as speed API, and then multi-die heterogeneous uh, integration or MDHI, and data management workflows with massive workloads, uh, right from uh, wafer starts all the way towards manufacturing with tests and, and the end product. And then I was lured away to create a small uh, group for looking at other projects, which are not necessarily in the Silicon Valley, but with also with uh, Government India, Chips Act, and, and so on and so forth. And been fortunate to be part of the uh, Angel Investor and Advisor Network of Silicon Catalyst for the last three years. Vic, it's amazing that you were involved in the IPO of Meta Software. And today, Facebook named itself Meta. So I know. we've come a full <laughs> circle from the days when Meta Software was basically something that was core to the hardware and software design to Meta, which is threatening to take over the entire universe through Metaverse. What do you think has happened? I mean, how fast is technology moving? How do you think it'll continue to change our lives? No, that's an excellent question. It often keeps us awake at night, as it were, in terms of how we can contribute to that, how we can expand this universe. But I think to your point, uh, it's, it's it all starts with the foundational EDA world in my mind and foundational semiconductor IP world, where the innovators put in so much hard work and so much creativity, which created the foundation for us. And then some of our colleagues in the in the cloud computing world, when the uh, computation and data started to become unmanageable with just the standard uh, networks of CPUs and, and GPUs, the cloud has created a brand new silicon to system in terms of the, the new world. And it started with IoT devices, so which I was uh, quite involved in, in terms of driving the IoT strategy, how we can use our multi-physics flows in terms of simulation for creating and, and supporting the IoT workloads. And there was a game changer essentially, and IoT has now indeed become foundational technology for many new innovations, from Facebook to, to Google to Microsoft and, and so on. Uh, all their workloads are all about silicon to system workflows and how to create secure uh, APIs and how do we create and how do we manage multiple uh, knowledge base and multiple brains coming together without exchanging proprietary information. So this is really the, the important journey ahead of insight is just the beginning. Now that we have silicon to system integration, do you see that we'll see more and more software driven hardware? I mean, this was something we talked about in the old days of hardware software core design. Is it becoming a necessity now? To manage the complex workflows, the, let's say Air Force. Today, the US uh, Air Force, as well as US Army, they have a massive parts depot as a key definition of a problem. For example, there are huge caves in mountains which store parts for 17 years because every device which is used has to have replacements in terms of failed parts. However, now, if you think about a scenario where a, let's say a fighter plane is in, in, in motion. If you can create on-chip sensors to create predictability in terms of its failure rates, its life cycle, then that data comes real time as opposed to having parts inventories being built for parts which never fail. That kind of real-time analytics, uh, for example, having the on-chip sensors for observability for uh, looking at what, what's happening at the transistor level in terms of control availability. So you could actually control each and every node in massive uh, ICs and then, and then for systems uh, over time. So with that in mind, you can imagine a world where millions of parts do not need to be stored as opposed to the workloads, the daily uh, workloads of a fighter plane or a, or a 
a bomber or a, or a ships and so on. And we can do that in the commercial world since many workloads are continuously uh, working on a particular device, either GPUs and CPUs. Maybe there are certain failure rates, especially if you have to really manage those for uh, heterogeneous ICs as dies get stacked, as well as side by side, as well as 3Ds. Then that becomes even more important. And all those technologies are coming together for managing the life cycles and, and also managing the cost of all the uh, compute power which we are using left and right, uh, thinking that it's unlimited compute power, but it's uh, absorbing all our resources which are around us, including the hydroelectric and other power plants. And speaking of resources, you've done significant work, not only in power management, but in energy management, thermal management. Uh, where do you see all this going when I mean, uh, there really isn't enough power in the world to have generative AI to run the whole world, right? That really hits on the nail in terms of how we as a community worldwide, it's not it's, it's not some locations problem, it's not a company problem, it's our problem as a humanity. It's, and we are, uh, if you look at some of the recent reports in, in Taiwan or in, in Seattle area and so on, the water supply, the rivers are drying up because of so much power is being used in the in data centers. Uh, same thing is happening in New York data centers to, to San Diego centers. A question which comes to everybody's mind is EV. <laughs> EV is just a localized power trying to save your, your car battery and car usage. However, all these charging stations are heavily powered <laughs> and they're consuming a lot of electricity. So solar energy becomes important. What are the key other uh, areas of uh, power and energy? And that's where I think our world from semiconductor side, EDA side, and uh, systems side will come in the picture. If that research continues, it's, it's so connected together. Each workload now has not only power, but also DIDT, as well as there is a spike power and continuous power. So tremendous power and thermal hotspots are coming all over the place, causing these failures, things in flight or things in motion or manufacturing lines, uh, especially automotive assembly plants and so on. Speaking about failure modes in flight, in motion, in manufacturing, I think we now have to make it even more reliable. What's the role of digital trends? Do you think they will solve the kind of problems we are seeing today? Yes, indeed. And uh, we learned about digital twins quite a bit at ANSYS. Uh, I got exposed there and, and the team there, including creative folks like uh, Dr. Preet Banerjee are driving digital twin. Norman Chang is one of the key uh, technologists who is helping in that. People are working very hard to understand how can we now recreate the real operational workloads in the lab. Can we recreate the, the fighter plane analogy or any data center? Can we create a complete flow, not just electrical, but also the consumption of each rack, each CPU, GPU within that rack, and then the airflow, which will require airflow management, which means airflow simulations. Then what is the thermal profile of the data center? And everything can be optimized with simulations, with digital twin. Assuming things are created as a representation of a working system and subsystems, and imagine the massive data center itself becomes a working model. Then you can predict with digital twin the life cycle, and you can also manage your uh, reliability patterns. You can predict reliability curves, and you can create replacement parts ahead of the classic bathtub curve if there is a constant feedback from sensors and, and digital twins, uh, which are actually working on the real workloads and simulating those. And you went from being a really hardcore good engineer towards being a people manager to running organizations, companies, strategy. What were the most challenging things that you encountered? That's very important. It's a lifetime learning, uh, which I strongly recommend to everyone who's on the career path um, in a similar journey from PhD, master's, whatever their technological background they have, how do we grow that? So early in my career, I learned to be a successful entrepreneur. 
And there are some important management and leadership trends, which I learned from people around me, as well as my own learnings, creating a, a way of approaching people. So what I call a CTP, which is customer technology and people. So understanding customer needs drives the revenue engine. Then technology drives and fuels the innovative products and supports the growth. And people who are the foundational in that pyramid, if you will, are the human assets, which are the profit engine of an enterprise. And you have to manage all three, otherwise things can fall apart. That I learned right from my journey when I switched to become a co-founder, CEO, and president of uh, Sequence Design for almost 10 years, and then joining Apache and, and ANSYS another 10 years, uh, learning with the same foundational principles. So what, what does it mean in terms of the, the learning from the best? So management is doing things right, but leadership is doing the right thing. It's an old adage, but you have to actually implement that in your daily life and with your key trusted partners with you. So doing things right would mean, let's say planning, budgeting, classic things, organizing, staffing, controlling, problem solving, and so on. But doing the right things, meaning really setting the direction and vision and ability to aligning people with, with inspiration and connections. I would say at least it is to take 30% of my daily work time, if you will, because that's part of the whole growth of how we have to push forward and starting with literally zero with, a, with of course, the, the funding from our uh, very, very good VCs. But how do we create that ROI for the industry? So power thermal specifically uh, was very important. That was the innovation we created as part of sequence design. Now, here is a very important thing I learned. Do not drink your own Kool-Aid. So people tend to say, oh, I know what the customer wants. Not true at all. You get out of the building, talk to the customer, you know, talk to the their R&D people, talk to the manager and the vice president of the BU and so on. So I used to give that lesson all the time and do it in action with other people. And I had created teams around the world that time. So got multicultural capability, which I strongly recommend everybody who is on that path. I created offices, R&D, as well as sales and, and product marketing offices in Tokyo, then of course, Silicon Valley, then in South of France and Noida, uh, and, and just two people in France. Uh, because they were there and they were working with uh, the local ST micro. Creating that team, international team, was an amazing experience, really getting the knowledge and the synergy of that. Also, over time, I developed how to learn and nurture a trusted relationship as an executive sponsor. So with key decision makers is very important. That's where I could add value as the leader of this, this uh, company. We had about 100 people that time. Two questions I learned when I used to meet with customers, which are very important, that is my mantra even to date, is when you create the closer relationship, let's say with a decision maker of, a, of your customer, they will be very formal during the day and meeting time and listening to you and all. But at night, over dinner, over this wine and drinks, two questions I would always ask, assuming you create that relationship. So the first question is, what keeps you awake at night? And what gets you up in the morning? And those two are important questions. I learned myself how to ask and how to get very takeaways and, and uh, which are actionable items from those. And people used to, uh, to talk about it very openly then, when they're in an informal setting and not in front of large group, but you create that very personal relationship. And I did that around the world with many key customers. And then other people around me, my senior leaders learned that as well. And by understanding these thoughts on fundamental questions, uh, I was able to bring that feedback to the key decision makers within our own company so that they don't just think of theoretical solutions and problems, but really think about the stated needs and the classic you know, uh, thing people, uh, Scott McNeely used to say, always think of where the puck is going, right? Uh, don't see where the puck is. 
Just imagine how the, the hockey player does that. And these insights enabled our team essentially to shape our R&D, product roadmaps, and then you vet them out. You again, go back to the customers and uh, his or her teams at the next level, make sure the technology is solid. And this, I was able to do that for over the years, thanks to my people around me and the companies and, and their our management that allowed me to go to people like Arm, Nokia, Sony, NEC, Qualcomm, and uh, those are very uh, fond memories. And then Samsung, TSMC, then Air Force I mentioned, and so on. Uh, and without, of course, talking about proprietary uh, information, we got the insights, which I could share with, with our team. And also I was fortunate to get a lot of learnings from when I was growing up to people around me. Uh, so I've been a champion of women in technology. And uh, that is, as a team leader and a CEO, including all the senior exec positions I've had over the years. And this inspiration really comes from highly accomplished women in my life from my childhood. So I strongly recommend to the emerging leaders to follow that. And there is amazing uh, knowledge you can get if you have women leaders working closely. Typically, people tend to go quiet. That has been a common experience even at DAC conference, round tables and so on. Uh, our women leader friends have expressed that. So I strongly recommend people to make it into large team. A lot of knowledge exists and people will speak up once you become uh, the champion. And empathy is an important virtue to become a, an effective leader, an inspirational leader. So it's the, really at the heart of design thinking. It's really an ability to put ourselves in other people's shoes and see the world as they see fit. Many times we as leaders, managers, we tend to just give orders or we talk down. We don't have that connection many times. Very important to learn that. And uh, that I strongly recommend uh, to people who are watching this video or, or, or learn more about it. And there are many great thinkers like uh, Seth Canadela. They talk about it quite a bit in Microsoft, how he's doing it and so on. And it is really the unmet and articulated needs of people and organizations. So, so for that, you need empathy about doing things right versus doing the right things. Are we as technologies doing the right things? Because what I see is that instead of getting free time, time to do the things that we want, we are more and more glued towards the computer. Our kids are more and more glued to the devices, whether it's games and other things. Are we doing the right things or are we just doing things right? Uh, it's, it's actually an excellent question. Uh, in fact, I do feel we are not doing the right things because of the lack of connectivity. Many CEOs are realizing that. Maybe there is a concept of hybrid work. Then empathy will not be created on Zoom calls. <laughs> Very true. So, guaranteed. And uh, it's not just the empathy for the sake of empathy, but in terms of uh, people become humble, they see each other's reaction. Uh, otherwise, you miss, miss this... Uh, uh, verbal as well as non-verbal cues. You know, people, when they are uh, in person, they might have a face saying, uh, you know, they'll just do like this, look around. On Zoom calls, you won't have a chance to, to, to observe that. So, which means the person is not quite convinced in that, in that uh, room uh, to, to really participate in the project, whatever you may be saying. Or good old exercise of whiteboarding, as is so important to see that body language and see that connection. And that's the way to get commitment from each other. And, and really that's doing the right things. You have been a mentor to many, many entrepreneurs since your own entrepreneurial days, since your days in executive management, not only technology entrepreneurs, but also to people in early in their career, as well as in social work. Can you get into that a little bit, Vic? It's an important question. We are always learning from people around us and, and see I can, on a personal level, can share uh, that learning with people around me. So really sharing thoughts both at personal and professional level is important. So if you just have pure professional conversations uh, within the work environment and no have uh, zero social interaction, 
uh, with not just chit chat, but really connecting after work, for example, like we all have done until COVID. <laughs> so I think that's uh, really important to see um, is always setting the bar. You can think about this way, always set the bar, meet the bar and raise the bar. And that's the most important leadership lesson you learn in terms of working with people face-to-face, -face, uh, having good, uh, effective and ethical uh, work habits. And instead of just saying those, you show them by action and people can see that. And that's what is missing in, in if we do too much of online meetings and so on. The other one is, um, is always setting clear expectations uh, with, ins with really ins inspiration. For example, high performers are not motivated by what, but they are motivated by why. Just because you as a boss or you as a colleague said, you know, do this. So why, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that is the only way to question each other in the positive way. And that is only in person over coffee, over uh, private meetings, or just three or four people in a, on a whiteboard. And the cause has to be bigger than you as the leader. That's the important part. Uh, so the team has to be inspired. And how do you champion that cause with your team? Another thing I, I did personally is amplifying success, even small. You know, first meeting with a tough customer, let's say like uh, Sony, you know, their sensor division is very tough, the tough guys. But if, if they say yes, even if two, three R&D people say yes to whatever you are presenting, as that may not be a successful purchase order, but somebody nodding is a success itself. If a team leader from Sony or NEC or ST Micro, during these meetings, if they, so that's worthwhile to share when you come back home. That's part of the listening activity and providing constructive feedback. And, and really have genuine interest in your team. It can't be fake as a leader or, or manager. You have multiple locations, uh, outside US, uh, in, in the Silicon Valley, we get a little bit arrogant, you know, because anything, anybody outside Silicon Valley is, okay, it's person somewhere here, you know. Uh, so never call a location of your R&D team or your, or your colleague as an offshore facility. It's a, it's a very bad word. In fact, I used to put a little sign with a big cross. Always call them as centers of excellence, and they just reside in those locations or engineers. So everybody is uh, in terms of sharing knowledge, uh, discussion, otherwise why are we having these people, right? So they have to be part of it uh, around the world uh, because the tables can turn. And those people may think guys in Silicon Valley, ah, that's people there. So those things can happen. So it's better to, uh, as a team leader and so on, and that is really uh, what is missing when you uh, brought out the question is people really have to start uh, meeting other people or team members and go travel may not be possible sometimes but you have to just uh, make an effort uh, creating projects which are meaningful for interaction so let me ask you those two questions which you ask in evenings and all what keeps you up at night at this stage in your life and uh, what is it that you look forward to when you get up in the morning <laughs> now the tables are turned. <laughs> so now it's a great question because I have to ask myself. It's uh, uh, you know, for if I'm not working in a particular company after what, 45 years or so, uh, you know, how is, what's the value we are creating? So one of the key things is to answer your question is how can I inspire uh, some of the startups? So thanks to Silicon Catalyst for accepting me as their advisor and, and, and that network and, uh, and the angel investor. That gives me very high energy. I already invested in many small companies and startups. Uh, that has given me the reason to, to think what's next. You know, how, do we, how do I influence them? How do I participate with them? Uh, about six or seven of us, uh, like-minded people who are similar career, path as I have, they are coming together. They're all technologies and so on. And now trying to create 
a solutions provider, if you will, and, and help startups and help projects like, uh, especially India is rising, as we all know, and there are many opportunities uh, within states which are heavily funded. So from people who may be familiar with some of the states' names in, the, in your uh, audience, but uh, people in Karnataka, like Bangalore, everybody's familiar with that, that state, to Maharashtra state, the IIT Bombay, then uh, UP, Uttar Pradesh state, IIT Kanpur, and many IIT centers of excellence and the states surrounding are, are thinking of large funding, just like we do in the US these days. It's very impressive, so that's what keeps me going. You know, how can we participate in that? How can we help those initiatives? Because the brand new initiatives, uh, and the world is one. There, people we uh, they just talk like everybody talks like us. They are part of the one community around the world, and it's amazing that the economical growth is already fueling the technology growth in all these states. A recent conference I attended called Garze Marathi. It had uh, 550 technologists attending, presentation after presentation from 8.30 late night. Uh, and uh, all are young entrepreneurs from everywhere, US, uh, India, then, uh, then in Asia, a lot of Singapore, and, and that area has a lot of activity, technology activity. So it's great to listen to them. And I'm connected with them uh, to see what keeps me at night is how can I help there? Uh, how can I create value? Uh, and with my other colleagues, uh, that's the journey we are uh, now thinking about, about six, seven of us. And there will be more as time goes by. That is amazing work. And may you always contribute. And to people out there, I'm always looking for your views. What's happening in the world? How can we use all this technology in a meaningful way? How can we create new technology? How can we create more harmonious communities? As Vic said, uh, technology cannot run our life. We have to use that to make our life more meaningful. So please come forward. Let's have discussions. And Vic, we have to meet again face to face. So I Absolutely. invite you to come and meet us in Carmel here near the ocean. Yeah, yeah it's just too. a stone's throw. I'll uh, take you up on that. And thanks for the opportunity to discuss things and, and talk to your uh, ecosystem. So uh, this will lead us somewhere for something creative for the, for the coming months.